Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rev Left Radio. On today's episode, I'm kind of closing a loop that I opened probably a year or so ago. Um, if some of you may remember, there was a, a, an attempt for me to raise some funds for a friend who was going through it, as it was, as it were, uh, was being targeted. I think I put it um, by the fascist right in a really intense way, but that I couldn't give too many details because it was an ongoing situation. And I said that the moment we could get the story out, we would do that. And this is that moment. So finally, because of various events that have played themselves out, various legal processes that have played themselves out, um, the the person who I was talking about in that episode uh, finally said, I do want to come out. I do want to tell my side of the story. And we, of course, create an avenue for him to do so. So this is the story of of Gabriel Geip, who was a wonderful teacher uh, in Sacramento, California, who was targeted by the far right, uh, the Proud Boys, um, the f- absolute Nazis, white supremacists, various fascists in California because of this project spearheaded by Project Veritas, where they more or less, quote unquote, exposed him for uh, being this scary Antifa Marxist indoctrinator of children and functionally um, not destroyed his life, but fucked his life up in the form of him losing his uh, beloved career and him and his family wonderful human beings who I know personally, um, being targeted uh, by the worst people in our society under constant threat of physical violence for a year straight and still to this day being actively harassed, active death threats against them, even though the people uh, behind Project Veritas got what they wanted. You destroyed this man's career. He is no longer able to do what he loves, to teach children. You fucking fascist won. And that's not enough. They still want to harass, to intimidate, to make him feel unsafe, him and his wife in their own home, in their own lives, uh, to menace them, to try to drive them off the road. This is not necessarily done by the people at Project Veritas, but this is done by fascists and you know right-wing psychos that were riled and fomented into a rage um, by what Project Veritas does. And, and Project Veritas has to know that when they do these things, while they themselves don't need to necessarily do the death threats and and the harassment and the threats of physical violence, they know that that shit is coming. And that is part of the glee, I think, a lot of these people get out of this stuff, is that while they can pretend to just be doing some morally noble thing, calling out an indoctrinator, what they're actually doing is ruining somebody who they view as a political opponent's life and career and make them live in a constant state of psychological anxiety and existential fear that they will be literally murdered um, as attempts were done uh, on, on Gabriel and, and his family since this project, Veritas, uh, you know, hit piece was, was released. Um, so, you know, he hasn't been able to give his story. And I'm sure some of the people that have targeted him and that have fetishized him as this object of their hate and their rage... Um, these sad, fearful, angry, bigoted people. Um, Some of them are probably listening right now uh, because Gabriel hasn't been able to speak for himself, and this is the first time he's been able to do that. Well, this is free speech, baby. This is Gabriel being able to talk about his side of the story, about his version of events, and correct the record on outright lies and slander and, and propaganda weaponized against him and his family um, to make their lives a living hell. Um, So I I have been a friend of his and have seen from behind the scenes this whole fucking thing play out. It's been heart-wrenching and gut-wrenching to see this happen and not be able to get his side of the story. But finally, um, we are able to do that. So um, you don't really need to know much. We, We set the table and then we go into the details of the story. So if you've never heard about this, you could go into this blind or cold and, and still get a really good understanding of what happened. But if you're at all interested, this is a huge event. This was covered by Fox News. This was covered by you know, all the, 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 the ghouls you can imagine, the Candace Owensons, the, the Tucker Carlsons of the world, etc. So if you go and just maybe do pause it right here, do a quick Google search, catch yourself up on the basics of the story, um, and then come into this, that could be helpful. But we do our best to give an overview before going into the details. Um, but it's a harrowing story. And as I say in this episode, he's really a canary in the coal mine um, because this attack on education, on public schools, and on teachers is not new, nor is it at any time in the foreseeable future going away. 
Um, so, so in a lot of ways, what happened to him is a template that I think will increasingly be used by the increasingly fascist right to try to solidify their grip on the myth-making uh, of America uh, for its own citizens, to destroy real education in favor of their rainbow and lollipop fairy tale version of American history and what life in America has actually been like for the vast majority of people throughout its existence. Um, so, yeah, for so many reasons, this is a fascinating and important episode. I'm finally glad that Gabriel's been able to tell his side of the story um, after a year of not being able to and having other people speak for him. So this is an emotionally charged um, but also incredibly timely and utterly relevant uh, story. And, and through the, the specifics of this story, a much broader understanding of the fascist march, the reaction, reactionary march against many things, but specifically education teachers, public schools. Um, it, it really is, is a condensation of, of that movement in the form of one story and one man's having to deal with that form of reactionary backlash and what it can do, the power of it um, to, to destroy lives. And so, uh, yeah, I guess I don't want to go too far. You'll hear the story throughout. Um, but this is an important episode for sure. And um, I think it's really important to hear Gabriel's side of this incredibly controversial and incredibly public story. So without further ado, here's my discussion with Gabriel Guype about his experiences um, being attacked, harassed, and having his career destroyed by the forces of fascist reaction and conservative conspiracy insanity. Um, so strap in. All right, my name is uh, Gabriel Geip. Um I am a... Uh, former teacher uh, in California, um, was previously on Rev Left doing an episode on dystopian fiction. Some people might remember that episode. Had a lot of fun doing that. It was actually like exactly two years ago. It just popped up on my my memories on Facebook today. So um, I am excited to be back and, and talking to you today. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome back. Um, I think in those instances uh, you were on that last time we had to sort of you know kind of conceal your identity because of the the political implications and trying to separate professional from personal life but obviously as people will find out throughout this episode um, you know, the situation has fundamentally changed such that you're willing to come on with your real name and uh, tell this horrifying story. And, you know, I've been privy uh, as somebody who's a, a friend of yours um, behind the scenes, kind of seeing how this this torturous year for you ha has played out. Um, it's been heartbreaking just to see the shit that you've gone through. Um, people might know that a while back I tried to put together some funds to help you, and I, I said I couldn't talk about the details because it was an ongoing situation. People did step up, as far as I'm aware, and, and throw in some assistance, which I'm very you know proud of and, and happy that my audience rises to the occasion like that. But now, finally, for those that are interested in what that what was behind all of that, um, this is the episode where we're going to finally you know, let it all out and basically allow you for the first time to tell your side of this story that has been told for you from the worst people in the world, whether that is outright reactionaries or just completely naive local newspapers or whatever. Um, the, the story is so skewed. The presentation of who you are, um, you know, what you stand for has been so skewed and uh, the shit you've had to endure is absolutely nightmarish. So I, I think, you know, we'll get into the details of the story for sure. But for those that have no clue what we're talking about, um, maybe a broad overview, something that can just anchor a, a brand new listener into what actually happened to you. And then we can move into the details. Sure. Yeah, I think that um, for most people, they probably would remember the story that was almost exactly a year ago. Um, as as like the Antifa teacher, quote unquote. Um, so it was a, a, a kind of like a, a hit piece that was done um, on me in my profession as a high school teacher. Um, and the uh, kind of the overall narrative was that I was, um, you know, indoctrinating my students into either Antifa 
or uh, into communism, like whichever, it depends on, on which news outlet you might have seen. Um, and then kind of the fallout from that, um, which was which was pretty extensive. Um, and yeah, I think I think that that's probably for, for most folks, probably what they were, uh, you know, exposed to it was it was something that like, I, I thought when it first happened would kind of stay as like, a you know, potentially a local story. Um, but then it, it blew up on onto a scale that I, I don't think anyone was really prepared for, um, which obviously for the, the news source that put out the original piece that was their intention. Yeah, and the national news coverage, I mean, it, it included, what, Fox News, all the biggest conservative outlets possible. This wasn't just a far right-wing fringe website thing. This was a broad conservative right. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, Tucker Carlson, like, did a piece on me. I was on, you know, Candace Owens' show, uh, you know, The Daily Wire, which is, like, Ben Shapiro's um, news, quote-unquote news outlet, uh, did some some pieces on it. I was on, like, Fox and Friends. Like, it was... Uh, it was, it was pretty wild. I think that for, you know, most of my adult life, I've, I've watched a lot of like, um, right wing media, uh, throughout, you know, since I've been politically conscious and, and I've always just been like, oh man, like if I ever had the opportunity to like get on these people's shows and like debate them, um, you know, little did I know that <laughs> the time that I was going to end up on their, their show, I was just like completely, you know, gobsmacked, totally unprepared, it was like, oh man, this is not, this was not how I wanted that to go down. <laughs> yeah. And, and I also think just this perfect cartoonish archetype in the minds of the right wing, as far as, you know, what you filled in for them, you know, the sort of archetype mm -hmm. you played for them. I mean, the Antifa hysteria, the communism hysteria, the our kids are being indoctrinated hysteria, the, the schools are ran by Marxist hysteria. It's all this perfect confluence of right wing fever dream, uh, paranoia and, and absurdity. And you kind of fit the bill so well that you were an, a, sort of a sadly a natural target for their their hate, their rage, their insanity. And um, and you certainly suffered at the hands of that, because, you know, when, when, when a story goes out publicly, especially on the channels like Fox and Friends and Tucker Carlson and Fox News, all of the psychos that watch that shit are going to be riled up and will come after you. Um, you know, I, when I was docked in the past, I was like on, you know, neo-Nazi websites. And the highest I got was like a, a mention on um, Alex Jones's Infowars. And that spawned just a bunch. Right. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. that. That spawned a bunch of just people trying to fuck with me, harass me in whatever ways that they can, often lazily from a distance, but still the cumulative effect was one of like, you know, psychological terror as, as it were. Um, especially when you have a family, you have a loved one, um, and people are making direct bodily threats against you and your family. But what you experienced was, I think even multiple times worse than that because of the, the reaches that it, it got to. Um, and, and maybe it's, it's helpful here to talk about before we get into the story, cause we're, we're going to tell the entire story. We're just kind of setting the table here. Um, it's helpful to kind of talk about who is Project Veritas. Some people will probably know, but could you kind of give a breakdown on, on who exactly that organization is and what they do? Yeah, so um, Project Veritas, I think, kind of gained national attention um, back during like Obama's administration. They had done like a secret recording of Acorn, um, and it, like their their founder James O'Keefe at that time had like um, you know dressed up as a pimp. Um, and came in with someone who, you know, was supposed to be like his, his prostitute sex worker that was in his employ. Um, and they were trying to, uh, get benefits like state benefits or, or federal benefits. Um, and they had recorded the ACORN employee, like encouraging them to lie about their, um, their profession in order to get those benefits. So that was like the story I think that kind of like launched them into national attention. Um, but they are, you know, widely known for um, kind of doing these like political gotcha pieces where they record people um, secretly, uh, surreptitiously without their knowledge and then kind of compile it into a way uh, to construct like a very particular narrative. Um, and there has been a lot of like issues that obviously have surrounded their work. Like most recently, I think like the FBI in invaded his his home because they had uh, Ashley Biden's diary and that had been 
uh, stolen from her home. And, you know, so the FBI's accusation was that Project Veritas had been complicit in that uh, theft, although obviously they're denying that. I'm not going to speak to what what's true or what's not. I have no idea, nor do I really care at the end of the day. Um, but that, those are the, they're the type of outlet that that works very hard at um, you know what they consider to be like vigilante journalism. Maybe they wouldn't call it that. I think that's what other people potentially call it for them. Um, but they're you know trying to be uh, quote unquote like activist journalists going out in the field. Um, setting up these these interactions with people without their knowledge, filming them, audio recording them, and then uh, putting it together um, to kind of do these like smear campaigns on people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I came to know them through the Acorn stuff, which was during the Obama years. So they've they've been around for for a long time, and uh, I remember that Acorn story being absolutely huge at at the time. Um, and it just seems like they've only moved even further to the right because with, with the attack on you in particular and the forces marshaled against you, um, you know, they were much more, ex- and this might just be a product of the time that we're in as different from the Obama era, just the, the outright neo-Nazis, outright white supremacist, fascist gangs, like members of the Proud Boy, etc. All of these organizations were working in, um, cooperation more or less, uh, to attack you. So while Project Veritas will present itself as a conservative outlet, you know, no more extreme than Fox News or a Rush Limbaugh segment, um, the, the connections in the cur- conservative and reactionary ecosystem extend to the farthest fringes of the far right. And those were the sort of shock troops that were carrying out various forms of very intimidating and borderline illegal, as far as I as far as I can understand, attacks and harassment campaigns on you and your family at your house. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that before we get into the full story? Yeah, I think that you you summed that up perfectly. It's kind of like the the forces that they have at their disposal to kind of do the dirty work for them is what they rely on. You know, it's like you don't, despite however much the right might want to draw connections between um, the left and news outlets like CNN, but you you never see a news report on CNN, which would then encourage, um, you know, left wing activists to go out and and do something um you know, at, to the extent that these these forces will go out to do something for for these sources, right? So, like, if you have Fox News or or Alex Jones or uh, Project Veritas put out a report, they they are reliant on the fact that it's going to stir up these incredibly um, you know reactionary bases of people who are emotionally driven by these stories um, to put people in dangerous situations. I mean, like when these stories or when this story was coming out and these posts were being posted, like just, of course, you know, like diving into the comment section, like, holy God, like I I was at at one point, like just taking screenshots of every death threat, um, you know, in in visceral detail of what they wanted to do to me, my family, my friends, loved ones. Um, And it, it just got to the point where I couldn't even keep up with it. And it was just like the the overall just like yeah visceral i just got to say visceral again like visceral hatred uh, descriptions of violence to be inflicted upon me and then of course you know it was like it, it was only a matter of time before some people decided to take action on that and that's exactly what what happened you know i had um people uh showing up to my house in the middle of the night like threatening me um you know i had uh two occasions in which someone tried to drive me off the road one time during the day and one time at night um you know had had people uh so that at one point this a, a group um you know was putting up flyers doxing me um and they were putting up flyers like all around my my neighborhood all around uh the city that i live in um and in an effort to like scrape them down, um, you know, I was almost like attacked by by people who were keeping eye on them, waiting for people to come take them down. Um, and it was it was just like this is a, a an existential threat to my life. Like e- every day for months um, was spent uh, just in, in severe anxiety about um, not hypothetical acts of violence, but like concrete acts of violence that were trying, you know, people were trying to inflict upon me. And and people were, were casing your house, cars outside of your house, all times of the night, 
Um, people yep. people knew the fencing around your house and how hard or, or or difficult it might be to get through it. So this was a this was not just like internet harassment. This immediately leapt from the internet into real life and was a real existential threat to you and your family. And I have to believe that uh, you know people in the Project Veritas organization they know exactly what they're doing. They know that while they can present themselves in suits and ties and go on Fox and Friends and act like this respectful journalist outlet just bringing attention to you know what they see as, as bad things in the world, they, they know that the actual consequence of what they're doing is going to be life-threatening violence um, as a possibility against you. And that is a huge part of why they do this. It's not simply we want him fired and removed from his job and then he's going back into the a citizen and we can leave him alone. It's just this one issue we have a problem with. No, they know exactly what's going to happen. They know the worst elements on the right are going to threaten you and your family with physical violence. And um, they continue to 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 chum the waters, as it were. Um, they're, they're not satisfied when you're when you leave. Right. When you were fired, um, they, they want to re uh, throw more gas on the fire as much as they can. The moment you think things are settling down. Um, they will, you know, throw more gas on the fire to rebring everything up and reintensify the situation. It, does that sound more or less correct to what you've experienced? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that you know, for those of you who who saw the the clip from from Project Veritas, they, um, you know, I I was secretly recorded, but then also I was confronted by one of their journalists um, outside of my house, like while I was walking my dog, right? So they they are not, um, you know, above doing that tactic of, of showing up at your the place that you live. Like, of course, they waited until I was half a block away, so I couldn't go back inside of my house. But they were aware of where I lived. They they came to me in my neighborhood um, and tried to, you know, confront me on the street. Um, and then, you know, within minutes of, of this broadcast being put out online, my address was posted everywhere. You know, it was, it was on every, every website, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, you know, and it was just like immediately, uh, people were just like, well, it'd be real shame if, if someone showed up at, at his house. And it was, it was literally the first day, like the, the day that the, the video dropped, um, I was sent home um, from work uh, due to safety concerns, obviously. And uh, as, as I don't know, within two hours, like someone had shown up to my house and, and took a gigantic American flag and, and put it in the ground of my front yard and just like waited there, just like wanting me to come out and like do something. And it's just like, are you, like, this is absolutely ridiculous. You know, and the person had specifically taken the license plates off of their car mm -hmm. um, and then like parked down the street with their, their car facing our house so that they could keep an eye on it. And it was just like, oh, like, this is, this is how it's going to be like, okay, like, all right, well, this is, um, you know, this is the route that these people are going to take and they're not afraid to take it. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I got, I was privy to this as it was happening because we're, we're close friends and I kind of got to see behind the scenes stuff. And I've, I've been on the left for a long time. I've dealt with this shit myself. I've seen a lot of other people deal with this shit. This really stood out to me as above and beyond even what, you know, the worst doxing uh, experiences I had previously been aware of. It was really a, a really targeted, relentless, year-long, every single day you walk out of your house, you have to be looking over your shoulder, checking the cars, you know, driving on the interstate. You said you got almost ran off the road multiple times. So even when you're away from your house traveling, you have to watch out. Has that car next to me been following me? I mean, it is, you start to get in this hot house um, sort of psychological state of constant anxiety. Your heart rate is constantly elevated. Car cortisol is constantly being released into your bloodstream. And, you know, the human body can only deal with that um, to a certain extent. After a while, it has to take a, a brutal psychological toll. So, you know, bef before we go even any deeper, I just want to express, like, m from the deepest parts of my heart, like, love, solidarity, heartbreak, like, you know, I cried over seeing the shit that you had to go through and uh, knowing you and your family, man, it just is is not fair. And so when you said, I'm ready just to give my side of the story, um, you know, we were here and, and ready to make this happen. Um, so with, with, with all of that in mind, let's go ahead and get into the story. So now that people have a general understanding of what we're talking about, and if anybody wants to pause this and go um, look at that video or, or, you know, just see what, what the basic structure of the story is a little bit more, you can. But now we'll get into the story. And this is the first time I think the story has ever been told from your perspective. This has been for the longest time because of legal reasons and safety reasons. You had just have not been able 
to speak out. And so your story has been told, as I said earlier, um, by the worst elements in society or the most ignorant elements in society masquerading as, you know, sources of information and objective truth. So, you know, let's go ahead and, and just walk us through this story. You can start um, from square one. I'll kind of sit back and take as much time as you want. But walk us through um, this story and how it happened. And then we can get into a broader discussion of what the implications of this are, uh, what other teachers and people in education can expect or ways they can protect themselves going forward. Because I think that's the ultimate thing you want to achieve here is get this story out, not so much as so people can feel bad for you, but more so that people can be aware of the mechanisms and the machinations and the strategies involved and the ecosystem involved in these forms of harassment because they are not going away. The right is only getting more hysterical about their moral panics. And um, when that hysteria ramps up, violence and hate and these harassment campaigns are just going to be increasingly inevitable. So I'll just stand back, give you the floor, and you can kind of just walk us through this entire story. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, So first, I think I I would start with um, the fact that, like, I... So I'd I'd been a high school teacher for numerous years, um, and I was teaching um, an AP, which is like an advanced placement course, um, which is U.S. government and politics. Uh, So obviously, I think that the the content that I was um, teaching can lend itself to a lot of controversy, like right off right off the bat. However, you approach that content, I think, can be viewed by anyone at any time, regardless of of your political leanings, as a potential uh you know epicenter of of controversy for a classroom um so i i had over the course of my years teaching um put up numerous things on the classroom walls uh kind of a reflection of like the political environment uh that we live in um and i i had kind of learned that from from previous teachers that i saw doing very similar things you know having campaign signs from multiple uh, you know, political campaigns throughout the course of their teaching had been, you know, uh, we had very specific rules, like we couldn't advertise any any um, propositions or like policies that were potentially on the ballot. So we couldn't be like trying to sway the opinion of, of students one way or the other. So like if, if there was like a ballot measure for healthcare in California, like I put up that sign after that election, right? So like I could put it up as long as it wasn't about a current piece of, of legislation that was to be debated and and voted on. Um, So uh, essentially how I've kind of gathered how I became, because I I, I was like, what is like some teacher in Northern California, like getting targeted by this like organization? Like who am I to these people, right? Um, So I I guess what had become, uh, I think the reason why I became a target was because I had an anti-fascist action flag in my classroom. Um, that had been there for four years um, and actually had, had been put up by a student, um, which I obviously, I like didn't protest that. I allowed my students to put up all sorts of things in my classroom if they felt like they it was meaningful to them, something that, of course, Project Veritas would never talk about or any of these other news sources would, would, would talk about is I also had a, a student who gave me a Gadsden flag um, behind my desk, right? So I, it was, I was not specifically trying to leave out right-wing paraphernalia. It was just that most of the time my students weren't giving me that to put up in the classroom. I had a student who did and I put it up, right? Um, So I I think that, uh, you know, obviously anti-fascist action or Antifa is is a widely misunderstood uh, philosophy, ideology in this country, and it's largely associated with a narrative that has been constructed by the right. Um, you know, not everyone's going to like sit down and, and read Mark Bray's book, which I think is like a fantastic historical analysis of anti-fascist uh, movements across not only the world, but like through time. Um, so essentially, uh, at the beginning of the 2021 school year, I received an email uh, that was passed along um, from the school secretary telling me that there was a parent of a prospective student who wanted to speak uh, to the AP Gov or AP Econ teacher. So it was sent out to that email was sent out to myself and, and another teacher. Um, and, and a few days went by and I um, eventually contacted this you know, quote unquote parent. Um, and we had like a, a 
probably like a 10 minute over the phone conversation. And so this person who, you know, I later found out was like an undercover journalist from Project Veritas had had presented themselves not only as like a, a, a parent of a prospective student who is moving here from Florida um, to California for work. Um, but they also identified as like a political activist. And they like during our conversation, there was a lot of like questions that I think were are very normal for like parents to to ask they were asking about like the you know the physical facilities of the school like is this a place that like you know has good desks are are, are the roofs falling apart you know um how are they with covid precautions like are they cleaning the room like just normal things that like i think you know he, he could have asked the front desk person but was was talking to me about it but then he he got into like well with the content of the course that i taught well i'm really interested he said in making sure that my son comes to a school that doesn't teach and i quote american pie bullshit right um so it was like well you know um definitely not going to get that in my class <laughs> like I, I take my content like very seriously and and one of the things that i um think is incredibly important and is part of the ap government curriculum is is political efficacy i think that uh, students involvement in their community is a foundation to government and politics and i and i really push that in my class like to be involved however that looks for the individual student um but it is a it is a big part of what i do like i'm not just looking at government and politics from a national perspective i'm looking at it from a very local perspective um so that students understand that if there are issues that they care about that they feel passionate about that there are ways that they can get involved like on the ground in their community uh, in their city, in their state, and and how that you know it's it's that very overused moniker like uh, think globally, act locally, right? Like I I, I want to utilize that with my students, um, and uh, you know I I said to him over the phone I was like because I have uh, 180 days to to turn my students into revolutionaries, right? Um, and this became one of the biggest like you know, the biggest controversial things that I said, it was just, he has 180 days to turn his kids into revolutionaries. Like as if I told him, as if I said like violent revolutionaries or communist revolutionaries, I just said revolutionaries. Like every single person that we talk about in an AP government curriculum is considered a revolutionary, right? Like we're, you know, despite how I might feel about the, the, constitutional framers, right? George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, these are all people who are considered revolutionaries by a vast majority of Americans, yeah. right? Uh, Martin Luther King is considered a revolutionary, right? Rosa Parks, like these these are figures that we talk about um, that are part of the curriculum that are considered revolutionaries, right? And, and it's that term, I think, that caught so much, um, you know, heat and every, uh, from the right. And every time, just quickly, every time they fly a a Gatson flag every time they put 1776 on anything, you know, they're consciously saying that, you know, we're part, uh, we see ourselves at least as part of this revolutionary tradition. And the far right, especially, is constantly talking about the need for a new, you know, what, what, what they call revolution, what we would call something like a counter revolution or a reactionary, whatever. But they also see themselves as in this revolutionary tradition, as seeing revolution as being much, very much on the table, as romanticizing it in their own right wing way. Um, so to think that these people are like, no, the status quo needs to be conserved and protected by all means. You know, these are people ready to go to civil war so Trump can get a second term. And they're, you know, Absolutely. and there's like, you know, he's a revolutionary he's trying to turn him into revolutionaries. I mean, it just is so silly. But sorry, that's neither here nor there. Right. No, no, I, I totally agree. And I think that like that frustration is something that like is so palatable to me because I it it is. I, I like felt like I was screaming into a void watching this happen for so long that I couldn't like say these things. And now like having the opportunity to, you know, I'm trying to, to keep my own like emotional response at bay because it's just so frustrating to try to talk to people about something that should be so explicitly clear. Um, but for some reason has been, uh, you know, manipulated or shrouded and misunderstanding for so long. Um, so at, at the end of this, at this conversation, he, so he, he said that he was part of an organization uh, in Florida called Get Out the Black Vote that was working to increase, uh, you know, African-American voter turnout uh, in, in all elections, local, national, et cetera. Um, and he was really, he was like, I've, I've like, they, they did their homework. Like they knew exactly the things to say to like get my guard down. So like bravo to them. Like I understand that like this, this is uh, ultimately comes down to a point that like I 
being the person that I am, I'm, I'm a trusting person. Like I want to see the best in people. I'm not going to think that someone's manipulating me to get, uh, you know, this very particular narrative. Um, but he, he was like, I've, I've worked with like the DSA, like I've worked with, you know, other progressive groups in, in Florida on these campaigns. Like I'd be really interested in getting plugged in, um, you know, into the activist community, like in, in this area of California, like I know this is kind of unorthodox, but would you be willing to like meet up with me for coffee so we can like talk about this? And I was just like, yeah, like totally, you know, like it's not unusual uh, for teachers to to be friends with the parents of students, you know, like there, it, it, we live in a small community, like you run into people all the time. In fact, I think it's like one of the um, one of the best parts about being a teacher is, is being a part of their extended families, right? Like getting to know their parents, you know, so that when you call them, if something's going wrong, like, hey, you're, you know, they, they didn't seem well today, that you have already like created a foundational relationship of trust that like, we both are here for the, the best outcome of your child in school, in my class, etc. So I agreed. I agreed to, to, to meet up with him for coffee. So it was like a, a week later, uh, we met up in in like a public coffee shop you know um this is how they were able to get around with that uh consent rule of recording in california because there's a, a, you know there's no expectation of privacy in a public place so they they were able to record me legally record me um and so we we sat there and had probably about like a 45 minute long conversation now, if you watch the the video clip that Project Veritas put together, uh, I think the total runtime of me talking is about four and a half minutes total. Like their their whole piece, I think, is like twelve minutes long. But there's a lot of like you know, James will keep jumping in and and talking, you know, saying saying how he how he perceives this uh, video. So uh, about a forty five minute long conversation cut and and edited down to about four and a half minutes with very little of the, you know, the person who was presenting themselves as a parent input in that conversation. So there's very little context to what I'm saying. It's just it's just a lot of things that I'm saying being put together in, in a in a broader clip. Um, and during this conversation, you know, we had a lot of time to talk about a lot of different things. A lot of it was like, about me personally a lot of it a lot of it was about like activism within the community uh at large a lot of it was about how i you know my own like pedagogical approach how i uh taught in the classroom um and then you know these were then edited down and in, into a very like particular manner um but some of the things that i like want to point uh, a light on that i think caught a lot of people's attention was you know, so like he he had asked like about Antifa, and it was just like he was like, I mean, dude, just like, do do you know who like Antifa is in in this area? And I was just like, yeah, Antifa is not like really a group. Like they don't keep membership roles. You know, it's not like this isn't an organization. These all these questions came off to me as someone who was like genuinely curious and and wanted to know more and might not have been super familiar with like more radical organizations moment yeah and, and a lot of this 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 uh, conversation in the coffee shop in particular largely under the pretext of you talking to him as an adult getting into activism mm -hmm. or under the pretext of let's continue this talk about my kid and also we can talk about this as well absolutely yeah absolutely so it was yeah a conversation between two adults in a coffee shop about a myriad of topics and we were like going in between you know and i think what was very useful for them was uh kind of how we were interweaving my personal activism with like what goes on in the classroom and then being able to mash that together um you know and there was a lot of instances in which their their video clip had to to utilize like parentheses about what they were pushing what I was talking about when in fact I wasn't talking about that at all. Um, like for instance, I was talked about a couple of organizations that were doing work in in the area, um, and I was like, well, you know, like this group, you know, they they do this type of work. These are the people that they reach out to, and then we have this organization that does this type of work, um, and they kind of work together. And then they put in parentheses after that Antifa. Right. Like, so I was saying like Antifa works with these organizations, which is like not at all what I was saying. Right. Um, and they they had to, you know, like I, I 
at one point said, like, I'm not asking you to be on the front lines, but I am asking you to be involved. And after me saying, I am asking you, they put in parentheses, students, right? Like, this isn't who I was talking about right. at that moment, right? Um, and and another uh, big uh, uh, clip that they kind of focused on was um, he, he had asked me, well, do you ever get pushback? Like, do, do you ever have, uh, like, parents or, or students who, um, you know, voice concern or or like they're they they don't like what you're doing um and that was when i brought up the antifa flag in my classroom and i said uh you know i had one year a student who in an anonymous survey at the end of the year um brought up that they were uncomfortable with it and and what the student had actually said in that anonymous survey uh was they wrote uh you know when i came into your class and i saw the antifa flag in your room uh, it made me concerned about how the year was going to go. But then, you know, like I, I got to know you and everything was fine. But I would really reconsider having that up because a lot of people don't understand what it's connected to. And so I was like, fair. That's that's a fair thing to, to say. Mm -hmm. You know, so I didn't know who had wrote the comment. It was anonymous. So then I, I uh, approached it in all of my classes the next day. Um, and I was like, you know, there, we have a lot of things on my walls in this, in this class that we don't have enough time during the year to like talk about all of these things, but we do spend a significant time in the fourth unit, which is political ideologies, discussing a, a, a wide range of ideologies. In fact, it's the only time in the class, the only unit where communism is mentioned. Um, because we, we go over all of these ideologies and there are six political parties in California, the Republicans, the Democrats, the Green Party, Libertarian Party, the American Independent Party and Peace and Freedom Party and Peace and Freedom Party is a socialist party. So having my students understand what socialism and communism is, is a fundamental feature of them seeing these parties on the Absolutely. ballot in California. Right. So like it's not. I'm not coming out of like, hey, guys, let's talk about communism. It's like there is a party on the ballot that's a socialist party. You need to understand what that means in order to be an educated voter. Absolutely. And, and as you just said right there, you're teaching an AP government course. And one of the sections is literally explicitly on political ideologies. You literally cannot understand the 20th century at all without acknowledging that socialism and communism, whatever your feelings about them, were present and still are present in our politics, like liberalism and fascism and everything else are. Um, and I'm also, to my understanding, you had a political compass um, up on your wall. Mm -hmm. And so you also had like a uh, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, but a swastika up on the far top right. Like this is what ex take far right politics to its extreme. You end up with Nazism on the left here. You take it this to this extreme. You end up with something like communism, you know, and then there's the liberalism somewhere in the center. We all know the, the political compass. But this is a, a class for, I mean, AP. So, you know, gifted students learning about the realities of government and politics. You're talking about all these different sides. You're putting things specifically in their proper places. I'll talk about communism only when we're talking explicitly about ideologies and I'm not pushing right. it. So all of this seems like completely inbounds, completely relevant to the topic at hand. And as you said, it wasn't picking sides. There was a Gadsden flag and a Nazi swastika as well as an Antifa flag and a whatever, a pride flag or whatever else it may have been. Um, right. So I just wanted to kind of yeah. point that out. Absolutely. No. And, and the, the political compass became like a, a, a center of controversy as well, because the narrative became that I was forcing students to put so that how that that assignment worked, it was it was unit four in the class, but I would do it as the second unit because I felt like ideology was really important to understand before we got into like legislation and how the government functions. You can't understand uh, praxis without understanding the theory behind that praxis. So we we would cover it is the second unit right after the foundations of government where we went over like the declaration of independence the constitution the uh you know articles of confederation the federalist papers we read so many of the federalist papers in this class they, they act as if i was like having them read the communist manifesto it was like <laughs> the things that i had them reading was exactly what was in the curriculum and they would love they would love that you're teaching their kids the constitution and the bill of rights and shit right right absolutely yeah. so then when we would do this this you know beginning of the unit i would have them take a political ideology quiz it's isidewith.com 
a ton of government teachers use this, have the students take the, it's a super expansive, it's obviously not perfect, but it's it's a pretty good ideology quiz. And what's, what's great about the website is that it updates itself, um, you know, every few months with like new questions about like new political, you know, topics, it, it will get the, the students' opinions. So this is all based completely off of their opinions. And I have them do it at the beginning of the unit before we even talk about what ideology is. So when they land at the end of the quiz, they land somewhere on the political compass, it shows them a picture of the political compass, it shows them where they land on the political compass, and it will show them like the top three parties that they identify with. So it will be like, you know, I am somewhere over here on the right. The top party that I got was uh, the Libertarian Party and like the American Constitution Party, you know, a lot of parties that don't exist in California, but somewhere else in the US. And then I would put their picture on the compass if they wanted, because they I would ask them to bring a picture and then they could choose. It wasn't worth points. They just could choose to do it. And I would put their picture on the compass so then the students could see like an overall understanding of where they generally landed in comparison with their peers or with, you know, other, other, you know, people in the, in the class. Um, and what I said in this, this clip that they recorded was every year that I've done this, I've noticed that my students move further and further left. Right. Um, and this is, they, they, manipulated this they didn't make me like you know they didn't show me saying this because i don't say it they are saying that oh because of my class they're moving further and further left and it was like no this is this is literally the one of the first activities that they do after we just go through the founding documents like i haven't taught yeah, anything yeah. yet in terms of ideology um and so this you know like this entire process just became the center of, of so much like He's pushing kids to, you know, show their identity and he's, you know, placing anyone on the right next to a swastika. And it's like, do you understand how the political compass works? Like, do you understand? Like, obviously, even the political compass itself is is inherently flawed. Like, I'm just basing this off of like a model that most people generally understand to be like a, a pretty good way to measure where you land ideologically based off of their own opinions. Like this was this was all based off of their opinions. I did not tell them how to answer the questions. I did not. I would help them understand the questions. Like one of the questions might be like, "How do you feel about the Dakota Access Pipeline?" And then students would ask like, "I don't know what the Dakota Access Pipeline is." So then I would tell them what it was, right, as objectively as I possibly could. It's like, well, it's you know, it's a pipeline. It's going to take crude oil from Canada, and it's and it's going across, uh, you know, recognized indigenous land. Um, and there are people who are arguing that it could present a safety concern to the water rights of the people who have lived on that land for generations. Like that's, that's the concern and why it's a controversy. And they would be like, oh, okay, well, now, now they can answer the question with some insight into what that issue is. Um, so, you know, this, this whole conversation gets kind of like twisted in, into a way that makes it look, um, as if I'm, I'm kind of like projecting onto my students uh, their, um, you know, their ability to become like left-wing radicals. And, and uh, another uh, potential, you know, a, a primary issue was the, these extra credit assignments that I would offer in my class. So um, as I had mentioned, like political efficacy being involved uh, is, is a big part of the course. So what I would do is that every every month I would put up a calendar on my whiteboard of different things that were going on in the area. So they, they could be something like, uh, you know, an author who had written something about either history or politics was coming. Uh, and you can go listen to their lecture about a book. Uh, you could go to, you know, like a, a food distribution. We have a food distribution every, every Sunday that ha hands out, uh, you know, clothing and, and food to the unhoused population. Um, or it could be something like the Women's March, right? Which is like a nationally recognized march that happens every year. It's, it's very liberal. It's very like, uh, you know, it's safe. Right. So I wasn't giving my students any of any anything that like potentially like erupt in, into violence. And on top of that, so I, I would put up a calendar of events that I knew were happening, but students could go to anything that was political in nature and get credit for it. Um, so I had students who who went to, uh, you know, a March for Life, which was like, a, you know, a, a, a 
quote unquote pro-life rally. I had a student who went to a Trump rally and wrote up a, a reflection and got extra credit for it, right? Um, I had students who would just go to city council meetings on Tuesday and get extra credit for it. It's like, it, it could be anything that was political in nature. Now I had um, one occasion, and this was when I was student teaching. So this was before I even had my credential. Um, I had a, a situation in which there was like a, a candlelit vigil for um, someone who had died in ICE custody. And I had put that up on the, on the calendar and, and a student showed up and the vigil ended up turning into a march. Um, and then some police showed up in, in riot gear. And I was like, oh my God, like this is not a situation that I want a student in. So I, and the student was there with their mom. Um, and I, I informed them, I was just like, hey, you know, it was not my intention to be putting you into a situation that could potentially like turn out, you know, turn into a violent situation. So I, I, would, I would recommend that you leave right now because like now, now the police have showed up and, and they're, you know, in the gear that would indicate that they might escalate this situation. Um, and then that, you know, gave me an opportunity as a student teacher to learn from that and, and make sure that I was very particular about the opportunities that I gave them and, and, and make them as benign as possible. Now, of course, in this clip, um, they had to put in parentheses that I was, I was having students go to Antifa events, like whatever the fuck those are, man. Like what, what are Antifa <laughs> events, dude? Like, what are you talking yeah. about? Um, so it just became this, this, ridiculous idea that I was inculcating my students into into like favorably viewing uh, communism because of course one of the other things that was in my classroom that got a lot of attention was that I had a poster of Mao in my room um, and this was like I think one of the height of of like cultural revolution uh, you know Mao propaganda styles right so it, it said in in Mandarin like uh, chairman Mao uh, like the sun of the nation, right? As like a play on words with like a radiating like sun sun behind him. Um, and a big part of, of the AP government course is understanding uh, media and media as an extension propaganda, right? Um, like I, I would always say to my students, it became like a joke with all of the kids that took my class because I was always telling them, um, you know, all media is bias. One of the early assignments that we did in the class was understanding how to like, uh, you know, how to identify bias. Um, and then after we went through ideology, being able to pinpoint which ideology the bias was, was stemming from. Um, and all media is propaganda, right? Like we, of course, we called it marketing in the US, but if you were to, to analyze marketing from any other perspective, it's, it's just propaganda, right? Like propaganda is just a method of instilling a, a strong emotional response. Um, so every, you know, like uh, objectivity, like give me a break. Like uh, everything that we see on the news, it, you you walk down the street, you open your phone, you're you're reading magazines. Everything is is propaganda. And I thought that the poster itself was a really good, um, you know, representation of of like overt propaganda, right? Um, and of course, you know, it doesn't matter to them because most people aren't like us and, and the fact that like, I'm not even a Maoist, right? <laughs> like if that, that doesn't mean anything to them because of uh, like, the, if they've gone into the milieu of like all of the, the ideological distinctions on the left, I think that even like most of us, our heads start to spin. <laughs> um, but it's, it, it was like, you know, this idea that I was like promoting like Maoism or something, I don't know. It was just, it was yeah. like ridiculous. And, and so, and what I think is, is also kind of interesting about this is that when I got home after meeting with this parent, um, I was like, yeah, like there was some like really weird things that he asked. Mm. Like there, it just, that like kind of caught, caught me like in the gut at that moment that it was just like, uh, that, that's a weird, weird way to phrase that question. So like one of the things that he asked me, um, because he was like, you know, we're, we're moving to Sacramento. My, my son is, is a young black male. Um, is this a safe place for him? Right. And I was like, well, you know, like I, Sacramento, I think is a pretty progressive area, but we are surrounded by a lot of like right wing rednecks. Right. Like there, there are a lot like we live next to a town that is called Old Hangtown. Right. Um, that there, there are historically a lot of places around this area that have been, you know, sundown towns. Um, and it it obviously we have issues with people who like literally drive around our city with gigantic Confederate flags out the back of their truck like. There are issues with overt racism here. Yeah, like the, it's it's not 
I mean, it's as safe as any other city in the United States, but I mean, these are problems that most of most of us face. Um, and then he was like, I just don't understand why people don't rise up, like take arms up against the government. And that was like the comment that I was just like, what the fuck? Dude, like, you, you know, we're sitting in this coffee shop and I was just like, yeah, man, like I, I've gone down those deep, dark rabbit holes before where I think like, why aren't people doing this? And he goes, doing what? So that I say it. And I'm like, you know, taking up arms against the state. Um, and then and then we look back at like history and we have examples of people doing that and then, you know, getting murdered and they become, you know, martyrs for a cause. And you just have to look at that and be like, well, you know, it, it takes a. It takes a lot of work. Like we have to build a movement. Like we, it's not a simple answer of let's rise up against the government because isn't that like ultimately like the right wing, you know, answer to it is just like take up your, you know, pick up your guns, fight this tyrannical government. It's like no. What I'm interested in doing is making sure that we have, you know, the, the ability to meet people's needs in the moment, so that when the state doesn't come to save us like we know that it's not going to when we're facing climate catastrophe you know rising unemployment extreme poverty um you know the dystopian hellscape that we currently live in what i want to make sure that we have is is water food shelter the ability to meet people's needs in the moment um without relying on some kind of bureaucratic uh you know capitalist system to be able to come and and relieve us of of these these ills. Now, of of course, you know, they manipulated that to make it look like I was suggesting that people should rise up against, you know, like I'm, I'm encouraging my students to take up arms against <laughs> the state. And Christ, I was just like, yeah. man, I couldn't, couldn't think of anything further from what I was saying. I was, I literally just said, we have examples of that happening and they literally get murdered. Mm-hmm. Like this isn't a good idea, right? right? Exactly. You know? Um, and, uh, and then the, the other thing was that we, so during our conversation, we were talking about China. He was like, you know, I'm really interested in, in like learning about China. Like, have you been there before? Like, I, I think that we could learn a lot from their model. And we we started having like a conversation about like the you know superstructure and and base and and like the cultural revolution. And I was like, he he was asking me to go into further detail of that. And I was like. Yeah, you know, there was there was a lot of excesses during the cultural revolution. Like some people were, you know, definitely taken out in the street and shot. That probably shouldn't have been. And then they like <laughs> they put that and like highlighted it in red. And I'm like, what are you trying to to insinuate that I was saying there? Like, you are you are you saying that I'm suggesting that people should be dragged out in the street and shot? Like, I literally just said there were people who were dragged out in the street and shot that probably shouldn't have been as an excess of what happened. Like. So, they, you know, turning this whole idea in, into that, I was this like, you know, violent Antifa slash communist uh, teacher who was, um, you know, encouraging my my students to be uh, left wing activists um, ultimately was was their narrative. And like you said at the beginning of this, I think that like I definitely fit their um, their perfect boogeyman. Right. You know, it was like I. Um, have been politically active for a long time. They were able to find videos of me like talking at at um, events and and put that in, you know, with their their larger clip. Um, and I think an, another uh, another you know, key point of theirs was that <laughs> when they confronted me out in front of uh, or around around my house, I was wearing a shirt that had a hammer and sickle on it. Um, and I also have a hammer and sickle tattooed on my chest, right? So they, they like could they found pictures from my social media accounts where like I didn't have a shirt on, and that like, like as if I walked into class with that shirt on or without a shirt on. Okay. Like I, I think one of the most encouraging things, um, you know, that happened after this was uh, kind of the flood of of past student support that I received, and and these letters that students were sending. Um, in my defense, and and I made it a, a key part of my class that students could not know my political ideology. And every year, I'd have kids trying to guess, and I cannot tell you how often they would guess a right wing ideology, wow. because it, 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 I I played devil's advocate very well in my class and and i would push them like especially the kids that were like left-leaning i would push them because i want to make sure that they're able to defend their points 
right? Because they're going to enter a world in which everything that they say is going to be highly scrutinized um, and become, you know, a, a, a battleground where that they have to test themselves and prove themselves that they that their views and their opinions are not only defensible but worthy of of defense. You know, so it it was, you know, they they were acting as if I was coming in there and just like, I'm a Marxist. This is what I'm going to teach you. Like this, you know, you get a gun, you get a gun, you get a gun. (laughs) Right. It's like, this is ridiculous. And you know, what was, what was fascinating to me and my first year at that school, um, I had a student come into my class during like lunch and she was like, Mr. Guype, I I wanted to ask you some questions about Marxism. And I was like, Oh, okay. Um, sure. Like why me? And she's like, well, I mean, you teach AP government. So I figured you would know a lot about it. And this other teacher said that you were a Marxist. And I was like, what? Like that shouldn't be communicated to students. Like if they know that, and I don't even know how he knows that. Like, I didn't talk to him about that. Like I I was perturbed that a student knew my political ideology, you know? Um, And it became like a situation in which like I had, you know, students would try to guess all all year, you know? And I, I remember like, most most often most students thought I was a libertarian and and it, and it was hilarious to me but I also think a very good testament to the fact that like I wasn't coming into into class preaching my ideology right yeah, like this true. this wasn't about me everything in my class was about inculcating my students with the ability to articulate their views um, and put them into context and then and then provide a larger scope of understanding of what those things meant. Absolutely. You know, but then of course that's that's not what the narrative was. Yeah, the the job fundamentally and the job you took seriously is teaching kids how to think, not what to think. Right. And and you know, I think you did a great job. And one of the aspects of the story that I just wanted to reiterate and reemphasize is the amount of grassroots support that you got from students that you've you've had. Students absolutely loved you. Um you know, you are objectively a great teacher, and that came across in this wide spectrum of support that I, I could see um, from the behind-the-scenes little view that I could have sometimes of this support from students, from your from your colleagues, if I'm not mistaken, from often parents of, of students that you had close relationships with. So this is somebody who is a genuinely great teacher doing their best to teach children how to think and not what to think. And even in those places where there's controversy— um, like, you know, making them take a political compass test, that's, that shouldn't be controversial at all because what you're doing is allowing them to get out explicitly their own values, interrogate what do you believe on this question. And that's crucial for intellectual growth. You're not telling them you need to answer this question this way or if you're on the right side, you're bad and on the left side, you're good. You're just saying learn what you think. And these asking a question explicitly is a great way for a, a budding intellectual or a budding mind in general to get a good grasp on what they believe as a as a beginning path to understanding who they are as a human being, so that's that's beautiful. The the, the concern about kids moving left um, in your in your course over the the course of your your class, you're teaching in California. You're teaching uh, diverse you know young students in a deep blue state, and as they learn more, the fact that a majority of them perhaps tend to move leftward. That is not your fault, nor is it to be unexpected, nor is it completely out of left field. Um, You know, my experience of learning about the world is a move leftward. Some people have different experiences. But just the mere fact that some of your students, again, in a very progressive state, um, in a very diverse community, would have left-wing politics, or the more they learned, they would move towards the left— they're young kids. That's not surprising at all, nor is it a product of your indoctrination. And then the last thing I wanted to say is— the political cartoons, the Mao thing becoming a huge problem here. You know, when we listen, when you learn about government, you learn about history, you learn about the various propaganda mechanisms of various countries. I remember deeply in like in middle school learning about political cartoons, for example, which is obviously a form of, of propaganda. Rosie the Riveter, any Uncle Sam poster. Uh, I remember learning about Nazi propaganda in World War II and some of the Nazi posters uh, that were put up. The Gatson flag in and of itself is a propaganda tool or is a, is a marker of one's ideological um, you know, place in the, in the spectrum. Um, and the Confederate flags, as you said, whether they're driving around in trucks or you're learning about them in history books, 
that in and of itself took on meaning that it was ideological and can be seen as propagandistic. Um, so the idea that the, one of the largest revolutions of the 20th century that still has profound impacts on the world today, rising China, is 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 off limits. You can't even have an example from that revolution as you know political propaganda is just it's just wild and shows the the bad faith starting point that they're coming from. Is this this is not uh, you know objective or neutral mediators coming to a conclusion. These are highly partisan people with an agenda, um, crafting that agenda. And the fact that well, the, the, the discussion was this conscious weaving, asking about the school and the kids and, and, you know, what's that about with this increasingly, you know, rhetoric about left-wing activism and I'm just asking for myself and maybe we should take up arms. This is a conscious ploy to get those two conversations so weaved together such that, in in my guess, they could be pieced together more easily. You know, you want him to say some stuff over here on this side and then mix it with the stuff we're talking about the kids and present the worst possible version of this conversation. Um, that That is my, at least, understanding of what happened. Absolutely. Yeah, no, totally. And, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in terms of the, of the overall fallout of this was that, uh, so Project Veritas ended up coming to, uh, the school that I taught at and, and kind of, uh, you know, confronted um, the school administration with like an ultimatum, like you need to, to give us a statement on this, or we're going to release this video is how I was made to understand. I never saw it, but this is what I was made to understand. They said, um, and so I sat down um, with uh, administration the day before um, it came out and, and we went over the comments over like on a piece of paper, of, of things that I had, I had said quoted and I explained to them like the context of the conversation, like I'm doing with you now, you know? Um, and at the end of that, uh, you know, it, the, the people who were sitting in that meeting were like, well, you know, like that makes sense. I guess we got to kind of see what happened with this, this situation and, and see, um, what they do with it. Um, and then of course, you know, like the, the blow up happens. And then a couple days later, um, the uh, administration sits down with Project Veritas in a one-on-one -on -one interview uh, with them. And during that interview, the person who's, who's <laughs> representing the administration, who was not in the meeting with me the day before, um, says that they talked with me and I came clean about everything. I said, you know, I'm, I'm Antifa, I'm part of Antifa, and I'm a communist and I'm teaching it in my classroom. And, and I was just like, what, what? Like, I didn't, I didn't say any of that. And, and not only did I not say that, but like you weren't even in that meeting. Like I, I didn't say any of those things. And, and so that I think was really the beginning of just like the, the process of, of watching a snow, you know, a story snowball of, of not only having my comments taken out of context, but then people just saying things that I said that I never said at all, right? Like just putting words in my mouth. Like I, I had obviously spent a lot of time in my class um, focusing on on the media. Um, we live in we live in the you know post truth world. This is the age of disinformation. Like focusing on how the media is able to manipulate stories and narratives, um, you know, to, for, to the particular advantage of of either you know, mainstream parties, either the Democrats or the Republicans, conservative or, or slightly less conservative. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like right. they, it, we, we spend a tremendous amount of time analyzing that. And it was a really good opportunity, unfortunate, however unfortunate it was for my, for my past students to see this in action with me as their target. Mm. You know, it was just like th anyone who had sat, and this is another, another point that I really want to emphasize is that I, I was, put in a light um, as, as if I was doing all this secret stuff, like behind the scenes, like, oh, this is, you know, like, this is what he's doing. No one knows about it. Bullshit. Bullshit. Like, everyone had access to my classroom, to the assignments that I assigned to my students, to the readings that I had them doing. Those were all accessible in, in my Google Classroom. 
and and available to parents at any time. I had I had multiple parents of students who had that they were allowed to log into my Google Classroom. And so anytime I, I sent an assignment to a student, it would also send it to that parent. Mm -hmm. So they had direct access to the things that I was providing my students to read, what assignments I was having them work on, um, daily warm up questions, discussion questions, anything and everything that I did in my class was open and available to parents, administration, members of the community, other, you know, national site reps. I mean, like I was teaching an AP class. This is part of College Board. This is a, a national organization. Um, and and all of that was available. All of it was available. Nothing I did was secret. Nothing I did was hidden. Um, I, everything that I, I did could be aligned with the College Board curriculum point by point. Like you, you can show me an assignment and be like, where does this fit in? And I can show you the standard that it did. Like, I was very good at my job. Yes. Yes. And and this idea that I was doing it all in a way to be like nefarious to get my kids to be like left-wing activists is just is absolute fabrication. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, you were a great teacher that consciously went out of his way not to do the things you're being accused of doing. And right. and that is what's so frustrating. Your life in so many ways because as you say, you're you're functionally lost this career that that was you've worked your entire life for you were getting you were are very good at that you found a lot of meaning out of um, you took your job and the responsibility that it implies incredibly seriously on every front and then to have you know all of that work all of that heart that you poured into this stuff um, you know turned into the worst caricature of a caricature of a caricature and then have that weaponized to threaten the physical safety of you and your loved ones. I mean, this is truly the the only crime here. The only bad things happening here is precisely this right wing, opportunistic, cynical attack on a teacher that is just doing his fucking job to the best of his ability. That's the real crime. But then you got turned into this, as I said, feverish, hot house caricature of a caricature in their eyes. And for so long, f just find trying to survive day to day, and also being unable for other reasons to give your side of the story. And so anybody could just say anything about you and you had a very limited ability, if any at all to respond. And it was really taken on board as fact um, by a lot of people um, with power over you and your career and you know, whatever, however that plays out. And that's kind of what I want to move into next because we, we know that how this video happens. We know what they're using against you. We know how they're framing you. Then of course this hits the, the school system. This hits this is now in a situation where parents are coming to school meetings, having seen these videos, these presentations of who you ostensibly are, and now they're riled up. Can you talk a little bit about that fallout in particular? Yeah, so I think that the the school board had a meeting uh, two days after the video was launched, um, or might have actually been the next day, um, and and you know within that twenty four hour time frame. Um, kind of there was there were all sorts of pages popping up on Facebook or Instagram encouraging um, community members to show up at at this this school board meeting um, now everyone it, 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 this was like an hour an hour and a half long school board meeting with like some of the most vile people saying some of the most vile things um, I tried to watch the whole thing when it happened and, and I couldn't I was just like these people are going to kill me like they they legitimately want to see my head on on a stake like this is uh, frightening in ways that I cannot possibly like comprehend, you know, and they were all doing this under the guise of protecting the children, right? Like we have to protect the children from this man. Like he is, he is a, a, a threat to them. And it was like, I <laughs> could not think of anything that I think that was more heartbreaking than the idea that I was ever a threat to my students. My, my classroom was a, a, a place that all of my students, regardless of ideology, we're safe. Absolutely. Um, and, and often when we would have structured debates in the classroom, um, you know, students who were more on the right often got ganged up on. And that's when I would jump in and help try to defend their points, obviously in ways that I found acceptable. I'm not going to, you know, if they were saying something that was like explicitly racist or sexist, I was just like, okay, and this is why that isn't a good argument. And let's d dissect that, right? You know, um, but that was also one of the reasons why so many of my students thought that I was more right leaning than I am because I was always kind of defending the the kids who who were having a more difficult time um defending their points because they were in a, in a minority ideologically um so you know they they have this this board meeting where all these people are are speaking um 
and I had kind of foolishly looking back um, told I had put out a, a video on my own personal Instagram story, um, which I later found out was, you know, some someone on my Instagram was recording these things and feeding it to the media. You know who? Do you know um, who, by I, the way? I have no idea. But no. was that a private no Instagram with friends? Also? It was a private. So yeah. One, so there's like yeah. a, some betrayal in this shit. Yeah. Yeah. And and I eventually deleted everyone off of that page and then added added people back so I could just clear house. Um, but I, oh, damn. Uh, you know, wrote or I said in, in this video, I said, you know, I, I don't want anyone who supports me to show up to this meeting because they potentially could be put in danger. And I don't want the media to to create this idea that like Antifa is showing up to defend this teacher, you know, because like that's exactly how they would have spun it. Um, and I was very conscious of that. So I, um, you know, told people not to show up Cause <laughs> if they if they supported some me. of your students wanted to. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you, and you I, said I had, no. I do student... not do that. Correct. Right. Um, and I, you know, had students who had who had reached out saying that they had defended me on Twitter um, and people were calling their work, threatening them, right? Like this, these are the people who are saying that I'm a threat to my students. These people that are le legitimately finding out where past students worked, calling their place of work, threatening them, um, uh. you know, threatening to hurt them online in these comment sections. Like this, this is, these are these people, uh. right? So this, this school board meeting is just filled with, Everyone and anyone who wants to see me not only fired, but like potentially physically harmed. Um, and they're given, you know, the ability to do their public comment. Um, and one, only one of those people, I, I eventually watched the whole thing. Only one of those people was a parent of a student. And it was a parent of a student that I had that school year. So we had been in school for, uh, I think, 12 days in total. Okay, so this this student I had in my class for 12 days, their mom got up, um, you know, and, and said that, like, that I was teaching their children, uh, she, as she said, fascist crap. I saw right? that. that I, I was that, yeah. uh, I that I came in that their daughter uh, that they had just moved to California and their daughter had, um, you know, been in my class for for two weeks and already was pushing against their mom's wishes um and that i was the reason for that and i was just like man have you met a 17 year old kid yeah, like for real. <laughs> you you like this this is what boggles my mind is like i can't even get my students to turn in assignments on time and you think that i have enough power to completely flip their entire worldview in two weeks like uh not not likely and, no and it, it, it is un, I, it is unheard of that teenagers push back against right. their parents authority that's unheard of right. <laughs> yeah never never have i yeah exactly and it was just like so this this school board meeting then you know blows up um and it's it's pasted all over that and i think that's when like tucker carlson did his his piece and and candace owens did did a piece on it um and this is this is kind of like a, a humorous and a, a a dark humorous uh side note um i at the time was going to a, a gym pretty, pretty frequently. Um, and, uh, I, I was like, I can't, I can't go anymore. Like I can't like leave my house without being afraid of someone hurting me. So I went to the gym to cancel my membership. Um, and I, and it was, you know, early, still early on in the pandemic. So everyone's still wearing masks around, around here. Obviously that's kind of died down. Um, but so I, I, I walked in with like a hood and like a face mask and, and I was like, I need to cancel my membership. Um, and uh, the TVs in the gym were the news. Um, every other TV had me on it. God damn it! And and I I was just like I I like couldn't. I was just like, are you like, how is this that big of a story? It's surreal, you know. It, it was. It was incredibly surreal. So I you know that that was just like the explosion. I think really happened after the um, the school board meeting, and then and then the narrative became that you know a, an emphasis on on what they have already been saying for decades right that education is is the epicenter of marxist indoctrination and that this is you know all, all these lefty teachers are, are coming in and, and turning your kids into you know trans anarchist you super know soldiers. violent super soldiers right <laughs> <laughs> just like <laughs> give me a break like i can't 
you know, like if I can get my kids to write like a coherent thesis statement, I feel pretty <laughs> successful. <Yeah. laughs> like, like, <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, that, that's, that's the basics. Um, and I, we can, we can talk about what's happened since then that, that, that conference with parents and the whole thing, I saw that too. And that was absolutely, you know, carnivalesque in the interpretation of some of these people. And it had to hurt your heart to think like there probably were some parents who were good people that just were under this false impression of you as this monster. And, you know, if you could have had a chance to either talk to them directly or if they could have seen how you actually taught in class, it all could have been cleared up. But it has to hurt thinking like, you know, I remember that student. I I had a good relationship with them. And now this mother is thinking on this... I mean, to say that you're now pushing fascist crap it just goes to show the ignorance and the naivete of a lot of these people. But it also shows how they can be easily manipulated, you know, and, and, and how you could get to the point where this person with this Mao poster and this anti-fascist flag is actually a fascist. I mean, it's just this this soup of confusion and it and it sucks. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. I guess the, the question I had for you uh, that I've had for a while that I wanted to ask is. You said that the the person who reached out from Project Veritas eventually got you to the coffee shop and filmed you um, had reached out to you and one other teacher. So my question is, how do you think you and that other teacher, or you don't have to mention them at all if you don't want to, but how did you become the the target? Was was there anything prior to this that would make you a target? Yeah, so um, I think that they they reached out not knowing um, which content I taught. I think that someone had reached out to them because they have like an anonymous tip line. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and someone had reached out to them saying the AP, because I also taught economics. I didn't teach AP economics. I just taught regular economics. Um, and uh, so I think that they, they thought that I taught both. And that's why they were asking that the teacher who taught AP economics, he, he didn't reach out to them. I don't think that he ever, ever did. Once they talked to me, they realized that I was, I was their target. But what I'm assuming um happened was um i think that if i was able to identify correctly the the person who um who sent me or sent them the tip uh about me was because of of this story that I, it's just it's it's so ridiculous okay so at the, during the 2020 2021 school year um almost every school in the United States was doing some form of distance learning, right? Like we were, we were teaching from home over zoom. Um, and, uh, because of that, there was certain things that as teachers, we had to rely on, um, more consistently than we would if we were in, in a regular class face to face with our students. Um, one of those, uh, is an application blanking on the name. It's a way to text your students without them having your phone number. Okay. Um, and like all all teachers that I know of use it, right? It's a it's a good way to like send out reminders, like, hey, this assignment is due, this you know, whenever. Um, so there are numerous uh, like confession pages that students would run on Instagram um, that teachers became aware of because there was a lot of bullying going on on these accounts. So teachers started watching these accounts without students realizing that we were watching them. Um, You know, because like there was a tremendous amount of like, you know, threats of violence, like fights that would happen on there that would erupt into the real physical fight. So we were trying to like keep, keep track of these and, and make sure that like, you know, they were shut down as, as quickly as possible. Um, And there was a, and they were all anonymous. So it was very difficult to figure out who was posting what. Um, And we came back to in-person learning uh, in like spring of 2021. Um, And and there was a mask mandate in all of California. So like we we had very small cohorts of of students who, you know, would come in on AB days and then CD days. And then, you know, um, so we try to minimize the amount of, of students that were there in person and they were required to wear masks. And someone on this confessions page posted, we're going to walk out of school tomorrow and we're going to protest this mask mandate. We have to stop this socialist agenda. Okay. So I, <laughs> I took a screenshot of that and I sent it to my AP GovKids in this app 
And I was like, if I if I find out that this is one of you guys, I'm going to fail you automatically because this isn't what socialism is. And you know that because we went over it in ideology <laughs> as like a joke. Right. right? Um, I'm, I'm an incredibly sarcastic person. So like I'm, I'm very sarcastic with my kids, too. Um, and they they all understand that about me um and and like so these kids like these kids are like cracking up and they're just like oh like mr guy go in there and, and teach them and i'm like ah, i'm not gonna get involved i just need you guys need to know that these confession pages are watched by a lot of teachers because like i know that like some very reprehensible things get posted on these and you need to be more cautious about this um so they were like oh it's on the confessions page so then a bunch of my students jump into that comment section and they start lambasting whoever this person is right um and uh so i i kind of did some some digging in it and i think that that was what caused it was that my students were then saying like if you had mr guype like you would understand what this thing is blah 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 and then someone came into my class saw the things that i had on my wall sent it into project veritas they got this tip and they're like oh we're gonna you know come after this this teacher um and uh you know when when it it first happened i think that most of us were like under the understanding of like okay well i mean where is this going to fit into the larger political narrative because at, at the time um you know the conversation around like school choice quote unquote school choice of, of diverting public funds into like school voucher programs has, had kind of died down so we were i was like well you know this always kind of fits into a larger narrative about uh indoctr you know left-wing indoctrination in schools so they might might utilize it that way but i i kind of was just like i don't i mean this can't potentially pick up any steam like this this is ridiculous like i'm just like this random dude who teaches the class and them you know like it who cares like this isn't going to be anything but i i think that that um ultimately was what what led to it was a student that i never had who who had some understanding of who i was as a as a person and a teacher um because of this interaction that they had with students of mine yeah was what led to it. And if a student is is already talking about, I mean, in the middle of a pandemic that masks are socialist tyranny, you can you just know that they're plugged in, their parents or whatever. I mean, this is somebody that has that sort of background ready to jump on the archetype of you, as we've already talked about. Um, so, yeah, so that, that, that I guess that does make sense. But we've talked about how the event happened. We've talked about the culmination um, in the, both the form of physical harassment uh, for you and your family, also in the form of trying to, the explicit goal at that point is to try to get you fired. This was ultimately, I believe, successful. Um, can you talk about basically what what has happened since? Like what, you know, this is, you've dedicated your life to being a teacher. And basically at this point, you can no longer do that you can't pursue that dream and and you've you've attempted and, and that has fallen apart you kind of want to catch us up on what's happened since all of that yeah i mean there there was a lot of um obviously like the kind of legal situation behind it um in in terms of like how that that played out ultimately the uh school was wasn't successful in, in actually firing me um i i eventually resigned um and uh, you know, that became uh, a, a whole new news story um, rather recently, which is actually what encouraged me to to sit down with you and, and do this because, um, you know, I just want to express my gratitude that since like from the very beginning, you'd always been like, whatever you need, however I can help. And, and I remember at the beginning of all this, just like, I can't say anything. And this makes me feel absolutely like that I'm ineffective at being able to do what I have taught my students to do, which is to speak up for themselves and, and to defend themselves when, when attacked. And, and I wasn't able to do that for myself. Um, and this, this kind of recent round of, of news coverage about like me resigning and, and the, the um, kind of overall uh, structures of that resignation um, is what, what encouraged me to do this. But I, I think that since everything happened, um, you know, it's, my goal has, has been to, uh, kind of help people understand, um, that this is so much not about me. <laughs> like this, this is a much bigger, um, attack on, on education. And I just happened to become like a, a poster boy for that, you know, and it, it was, it was 
really difficult to kind of see how this fits into that um, that structured uh, battleground that they've that they've created. Um, you know, and and I think that you know when we were talking about the the school board meeting and the, and kind of the naivety of of around of calling calling me a fascist, right? But that that ultimately plays into the obfuscation that works very well for the right to to label uh, the left as as fascist, and it's often done in a way that's like, oh, well, you know, they're uh there's a protest against richard spencer they're shutting down freedom of speech that's because they're fascists right, right? right um and and to to plug your recent episode on on red menace that that you and allison did on um the three-way fight which i th- highly encourage all of your listeners to to listen to um you you both did a fantastic job of of kind of um creating a, a foundational understanding of of this this current political moment that we're facing when it comes to like the rise and threats of fascism and how uh, they're using education um, as kind of a bludgeoning tool. Like it's, it's being uh, utilized to, to push um, a very particular political agenda um, under the guise of objectivity uh, because the ultimate, uh, you know, kind of framework that they have, been able to establish is that the left comes in to these educational spaces and indoctrinates students and that they should just come in and teach the curriculum, right? Um, as if the curriculum that's established hasn't been established through a political battle. Right, exactly. Right, um, that these things that we teach, regardless of, of uh, your own political understanding, they are political. There, there is no objective way to teach government and politics. Um, and the idea that we can, um, I think is a testament to most people's inability to fully understand uh, political bias and how it is manifested and reflected um, in everyday life, right? Like how are you supposed to teach both sides of the civil rights movement? Right. But like that, that's the that's, you know, quote unquote, the encouragement that that you get from from these people is that you are supposed to, um, you know, be uh, just presenting the information. Right. Um, Like in in California, we've adopted ethnic studies as as a requirement for high school. How are you supposed to teach ethnic studies from both sides? Right. Like, are, are you supposed to talk about. Um, you know, and, and we're seeing this play out in, in a lot of states like Florida, um, where you are uh, no longer allowed to present information um, that could make any student feel uncomfortable um, on a basis of race is one of the defining categories. So this is their ultimately their attack on, quote unquote, the, you know, critical race theory being implemented in schools, which, of course, is not being implemented in schools at all. Um, and is a testament to their misunderstanding of what critical race theory is. But they, the idea that anything that could potentially make students uh, who, like white students, feel uncomfortable about the topics needs to be avoided at all costs, right? So like if, if we're talking about slavery, um, you know, we need to talk about it in a way that doesn't make anyone feel uncomfortable, right? Like how... This and this is their goal, right? Is to is to create a curriculum and to create an educational environment in which their ideology is seen as the status quo. Exactly. Um, and there and since it's the status quo, is therefore objective, yes. right? Like we, as as you know, politically conscious individuals, we understand the role of of cultural hegemony and how that plays out in education institutions, and the fact that these people who want to control and dictate curriculum um, are doing so under the guise of remaining apolitical, um, are remaining objective, uh, centrist, if, if you want to apply that term to it, even though they would probably even disagree with that. Um, but ultimately, their, their goal is to, to teach the history of, of America from a, a Western chauvinist perspective um, and from a, a inherently imperialistic and nationalist perspective, which is, you know, the the foundation of, of fascism. And I think that there are a, a lot of very significant texts that have been written on this. Um, and the advantage that they have um, is being able to, to muddy the waters as much as possible by misusing terminology um, and misapplying um, ideology, 
right? Like um, I, I follow a lot of right wing accounts just to like keep keep a finger on the pulse and and uh, Prager University. Great, great Prager U um, <laughs> posted a thing the other day that was like the founder of fascism was a student of Marx, right? And and it was like that. That's like saying that Milton Friedman is a student of Marx right. because he read Marx, <laughs> right? Like, it, it, of course, people who are are serious about political philosophy, political economy, um, are, are going to read Marx. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you don't, you don't have a firm grasp over the entirety of that content. 100%. Like to ignore Marx would be a huge disservice to it, right? Um, so to to act as if someone who was the foundation of fascist ideology was a student of Marx because they had read and critiqued Marx is 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 obviously just patently false, right? But they they don't have to they don't have to worry about people who are are absorbing that to do any background research to do to do any any digging into their claims they can just say something and and it's true yes right and then if they if other people just regurgitate it then that just shows the validity of their statement mm -hmm. and and that i think is one of the deepest ironies in a story full of ironies which is as we said earlier what you are objectively doing is teaching your students how to think and not what to think under the guys of trying to or pretending like they're doing that they're actually literally deep down wanting to teach what to think and not how to think because at the moment you start teaching anybody to think critically about american history you're going to immediately piss off the fairy tale lollipop and rainbow version that the conservative as now internalizes a part of their very self um, and so th this whole idea that you're the one leading kids astray and what they want is just for you to stick to the neutral objective material when it is actually precisely the opposite. You're teaching an, an unobjective reality, government, politics, right? There's no objective necessarily objective way to talk or think about those things, but you're doing it in the proper way, the way that a responsible teacher should do it. And they really don't want you to do that. They don't want kids to learn how to think critically about their own history. They want them to be given this fairy tale version that makes the conservative feel comfortable. And um and so, you know, they present this in this absolutely upside down way where they're the ones fighting for objectivity and truth and against fascism when it is just this wild projection, which if you understand psychological projection, you'll immediately understand eighty five percent of right wing American politics. And I think that's at play here. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, I think that that, you know, is, is a, a constant source of frustration is, is watching kind of the right wing attacks on the left and their uh, ability to, to just, you know, it, it, we're similar age. And I don't know if you ever watched Pee Wee's Playhouse when you were a kid, but I <laughs> feel like it is the, the perfect line, the Pee Wee, the Pee Wee insult. Like, I know you are, but what am I? You know, and and that's the, exactly what happens. It's like you make the, the the accusation accurately to these people, like, "Hey, these are these are fascists, right?" Like, because I understand, and and I think again that that you and Allison did a, a really good job on that that last episode of, of Red Menace, and, and kind of highlighting how difficult it is for people to clearly identify and define what fascism is, and that they fascists are able to utilize that to their advantage, mm -hmm. right? But when we make the accusation that these people are, are fascists, we're doing so with a, a historical and political understanding of what that movement is, what it represents historically, as well as contemporary. Um, and all they have to do is say, that's you. <laughs> exactly. Right? And and like everything then that we've done and, and the, the copious amount of, of research and, and, and education and understanding of these movements and, and being able to articulate this is why you're fascist A, B, C, and D, right? Here's the reasons why I'm, I'm applying that label to you and the, and what the course that you've chosen. And all they have to do is turn around and just be like, but you're a fascist. Mm -hmm. And then like, it just crumbles. Yeah. Then just like, everyone's just like, well, that's, that's what, you know, Dennis Prager said, so I guess that's what's true. Right. You know, and it's like, oh my God, like how much time do I have? You know, I'm, I always think about that quote from like Che where he's like, I don't have time to show you how wrong you are. And then he's like, you know, what's going to bother me if I don't. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. And I also want to frame all of this. At, you know, we talked about the attack on the left and all the fantasies and feverish, you know, paranoia of the right. 
Um, there's also this explicit and long-standing attack on public schools in and of themselves. A lot of this is one of the targets of these sorts of movements is the very idea of public school, the very values that underpin public funds going to educate people, you know, not just white kids, but everybody. Um, and, and, and that, that is a part of this psychological makeup. And it's also what made you such a good archetype and target for them. Um, but also, you know, th- this is a broader attack. And like in Florida right now with DeSantis, you see this new, this new policy where they're now going to let veterans, military veterans without bachelor degrees teach in their in their Florida public schools, the only credentials right that you that you have to have ostensibly under this policy is having gone to the military, and that somehow equips you with the intellectual, um, moral, responsible elements of being a good teacher. And being a good teacher, also, and as I'm sure you would agree, is not just knowledge of the facts and the ability to teach it, but it's more nuanced, uh, less more abstract things like classroom management. Um, you know, dealing with perhaps a problem child and trying to keep everybody else on task, dealing with the kids uh, home problems spilling over into the classroom. These are all, you know, skill sets that need to be educated and developed through experience. And this idea that you can just throw somebody in the classroom because he was a 19 year old and went and killed some people in Iraq. And that's all the credentials he needs to teach your kid. I mean, this is insanity, but it's all part of this much broader attack on um, on public schools in in general, I think, and it's 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 broader than you, but you are a sort of perfect you know inflection point for them. On um, yeah, totally, and and that point, I just really want to drive that home that teaching is is so much more than knowing your content area. In fact, I remember when I did did my student teaching, um, that was something that uh, was because un, under social science, the the credential. Um, qualifies you to teach, you know, U.S. history, world history, ethnic studies, um, econ, government, and psychology. And and I remember uh, just being like, I don't know anything about psychology. Like, I, if I had to teach that class, like, I would be at a severe disadvantage. Like, I would not be doing my my students any service, you know, teaching, teaching them that class. And I remember uh, my master teacher at that time was just like, man, 90% of what you do as a teacher is not delivering content. And and it's so true. It's, it's a, a vast majority of it is, um, you know, a variety of other roles that you play as a teacher. Um, and obviously, like having mastery of your content is is something that we would p- hugely prefer um, for all of our teachers to have. But it's it's yeah, I can't imagine you know some nineteen or twenty year old person coming out of the military feeling equipped that they're able to handle a classroom. Like, I, good luck. Yeah, exactly. Like you know, we'll we'll see how how well that and, and and as if some person who's coming out of the military is somehow objective. Right. Right. You know, when it comes to their role that they play in, in education. Um, but in, in terms of the kind of the overall attack on on education, I, I had two quotes that I wanted to read um, out, out of Jason Stanley's book, How Fascism Works, uh, The Politics of Us and Them, which is, is a great, very quick read. I highly recommend it to, to anyone. Um, but he has a, an entire chapter. And this is also, I think, touched on pretty um, extensively in Bryn Tannehill's uh, recent book, uh, American Fascism, which I also highly, highly recommend uh, folks to read. Um, but this chapter on on anti-intellectualism um, really focuses it on and hones in on on like kind of the right wing attack on education as an institution and and its kind of history of doing so. Um, so Stanley says. Uh, This does not mean that there is no role for universities in fascist politics and fascist ideology. There is only one legitimate viewpoint, that of the dominant nation. Schools introduce students to the dominant culture and its mythic past. Education, therefore, either poses a grave threat to fascism or becomes a pillar of support for the mythical nation. And I think that that um, really articulates that there is no middle ground. Right. And, and this right there, there are um, and, and as products of the American school systems, you know, both of us can test testify to the fact that like the the mythic nation as being part and parcel for the curriculum is is its core value. Right. Like the United States is consistently shown to be, uh, you know, the hero historically on the right side of history that even though it might have had um, 
you know, a sordid past with a discrimination and, and slavery that like we've ulti ultimately overcome those things, uh, that we've we've become a, a beacon for uh, freedom and democracy um, and equality that the world aspires to. Um, and that ultimately is, is what these people are arguing should be taught in classrooms. Yeah. Um, regardless of, of the the reality of the situation, it is um, this idea that that America stands as um, you know this benevolent empire uh, that sees the rest of the world as um, its playground, right? That that we're going to help the rest of the world. We're going to we're going to do the and if and if they step out of line, that we have the vested authority um you know because we're god's chosen people essentially to to punish them right to to put them back in into order and anyone who stands um in in contradiction to our our global hegemony is is only doing so um on a basis of illegitimacy um and tyranny you know and and that's their 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 goal when when pushing people out who want to restructure the way that education is um is perceived right as as not uh a fostering of of the dominant culture as a place where students are able to come uh, find things that they're passionate about um, be given tools and resources um, so that they can ultimately at the end of the day create a better world something that they are proud of right like we're, we're all supposed to be stewards of this planet and 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 students should come out of school feeling that they have the ability to change the world around them to to be more equitable to be more just um to be something that they are are not uh, a victim of right that they are an active participant um in creating their their future yeah yeah incredibly well said um, and, you know, the, the idea that – I mean we all know it's a laughing stock. this idea that public schools are Marxist indoctrination centers. The only thing you really have to do to dispel yourself of that, you know, lie is just ask like a normal everyday American, you know, somebody that maybe just graduated high school, has a job, has a family, isn't a super political person, doesn't even, you know, think or maybe not even vote. Ask them just like, you know, what are your thoughts on America? And a lot of those people will regurgitate that middle school, elementary school, and high school propaganda. If it was true that Marxists have been and are in control of the educational institutions, then you would see a more ambient level of basic Marxist things being taken as common sense rather than the anathema that they're often treated as. To present Marxist ideas so often, uh, even to non-political, ostensibly non-political people, will immediately hit a roadblock. Whoa, 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 what are you saying? And that shows that that passively consumed propaganda that they've been force-fed their entire lives is towards is gearing towards the right towards these protection of these myths and these narratives and i think what the right wing is going through now especially in the last few years with black lives matter protests the trump administration you know millennials and gen z's preferring socialism over capitalism is they're they're really feeling that these myths that have been central to their own sense of self and their entire worldview really are collapsing and they really are because every you know, you know, fairy tale we've been told about America is being stripped and revealed for what it actually is, you know, moment by moment, year by year. And more and more people are saying everything they told us about capitalism is bullshit. You know, <laughs> everything they're telling us about how great America is, is bullshit. I actually know some people and because of the Internet, I can talk to people in different countries. This idea that America is God's chosen country and the best country to ever exist is bullshit. People are just coming to these realizations as America is revealing itself to be what it actually is. And this is causing a great amount of anxiety among conservatives and reactionaries alike. And so they have to overextend themselves. They have to go out of their way to get more. They have to become more radical. They have to become more fascist to keep the lid on. Um, and I think you are a victim of that, as so many others are as well, a victim of that increasing insecurity and hysteria and feeling as if they are losing um, the, the narrative battle, let alone the ultimate political and cultural one. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Perfectly said. Um, you know, over the past week, there has been uh, several other pe people who work in the, the field of education who've been, you know, targeted by uh, Project Veritas. And, and it just, 
is an example of of how they are continuing this this battle, right? That this this is ultimately a part of that larger uh, culture war, war that I, that everyone needs to take seriously, right? Um, that this is a, a part of the backlash of, um, you, you know, especially within education, the ability for people to have, uh, have been able to like shape the way that curriculum is, is developed, right? Like there is a much broader a group of people who are developing curriculum, right? There is a much broader understanding of like whose voices we should not be marginalizing anymore, right? Um, when we're teaching things like history and politics, like the the ability to focus on uh, people who've been historically oppressed and giving their side of history um, when we're teaching about events like World War II or the Civil Rights Movement or, you know, the American Revolution and even being able to talk about, you know, the indigenous people who who were being subjected to a genocide were also writing and creating history. Now it's time for us to amplify those histories, right? So that we understand that this entire, this entire, the context of this nation cannot and should not be perceived only through the eyes of, of wealthy land-owning in individuals, right? Le- wealthy landowning white men, right? That that these there are there are other voices here that need to be taken into consideration. And we have been, you know, people, educators, curriculum developers have been successful in doing that, right? And now what we're seeing is a massive backlash against that. Any any semblance of of progressive, you know, quote unquote progressive education is being attacked with the utmost veracity. Um, at a level, I think that is is completely um, disproportionate to to what's actually happening, right? Because anything that's progressive gets labeled Marxist, right? Mm-hmm. Anything that amplifies the voices of women or or people of color is Marxist, yeah. right? Every, everything is just a tool of quote unquote cultural Marxism, and they're they're able to say those things out loud, right? I mean, how much, how how many times does Tucker Carlson talk about cultural Marxism? with absolutely no irony um, and no one's calling them out for using just a, a straight anti-Semitic dog whistle. Right. Um, and I mean, people are calling them out, but like the people, the people who, who listen yeah. to those shows don't, don't care. Right. They're just co- either completely unaware or they, they are aware and they don't care because they know that it, that it ultimately serves their agenda and their worldview. Absolutely. And, and the, the immediate mobilization of, of anti-communism to tar anybody to the left of, you know, I don't know, to the left of Joe Rogan is, you know, they're all Marxists. They're all communists. There's no distinctions, as you said earlier, between like a liberal and a socialist or whatever. Um, It's just all seen as that. And then this anti-communism that's been beaten into the heads of every American for a fucking century is the easiest thing to just to to, to use as a bludgeon for anything. Um, During Martin Luther King and the civil rights, there are constant attempts to tie him to communism. This is a communist threat. Uh, Black liberation, civil rights is a communist plot. It's just a, a current in American history that any progressive movement at all will be met with reaction that will almost always take the up take up the anti-communist bludgeon as a part of that, that that attempt to to react and create backlash to progressive movements forward and it's just a fact that if you actually want to understand american history if you truly want to understand as close to object objectively as possible american history you would have to understand it through the eyes of the founding fathers and that mainstream version Understand it through the eyes of the indigenous people who were genocided to create room for it. Understand it through the eyes of the of the Africans who were kidnapped and forced into centuries and centuries of enslavement and then Jim Crow brutality. Understand it through the eyes of women, through marginalized gender and sexual identities. And if you can see, like, this is how the black experience of America is. Here's the w- woman's experience of America, you know. And then we, we already are beaten into the head with the white male, you know, founding father's version of it. Uh, then you can kind of, then you can think critically, have all these perceptions. And that's how you can actually come to a reasonable understanding, objectively, if you can even say that, of American history. But it's their, their exact attempt is to eliminate everything except for that mainstream, same shit being taught 50 years ago version of American history. Um, And so, you know, they are actually against learning the real history. They want to preserve their mythical version. Um, And so I think that's that's very clear here. We've talked about the, the story. We've gone through the details, the implications broadly. 
Uh, you said you had a quote. Maybe you have another one. This would be a time to read that. But is there anything else you want to say uh, at all? Uh, anything you want to say to teachers in particular or any advice you might give to maybe somebody who, you know, shares or doesn't share our politics, but wants to be a teacher and navigate that in a way that they don't become a target of this insane moral panic on the right? Yeah, um, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where I, I it's like with with a heavy heart think that um you know teachers understand i guess like that they they all have like a target on their back you know especially for supporting um students who are uh marginalized historically oppressed right like i i know that there was a, an immediate backlash in the surrounding area where teachers were all told to take down anything that could be perceived as political right so any any pride flag was told to be taken down right any anything um related to black lives matter as a movement right and and of course like these these are are movements that automatically get pigeonholed into like marxism right like as you just said that's it's always the tool that they default to is claiming that these things are all all marxist that they that these movements are a tool of of nefarious like marxists behind the scenes pulling the strings um i think that we're in currently a a huge national teacher shortage right um and and teachers who are are passionate about teaching going into a profession that not only gets generally treated like garbage um but also gets paid like garbage um, in comparison to other professionals with advanced degrees, like I don't see a lot of incentive for people going into a field in which they are going to become, um, you know, potentially the next person who who gets attacked by by these people. Um, I think that there are a tremendous amount of of educators who are are just selfless incredible human beings that give so much of themselves emotionally, physically, mentally to their profession. Um, and, and I encourage them to, to not be, um, you know, not have their light snuffed out by, by stories like this. But at the, at the same time, I, um, am very aware of, of the, the, the long game of this tactic that the, the right is using that, that ultimately, their goal is to grind teachers down, right? Um, and consistently put them in a position of, of defense uh, where anything, um, and of course it's only, it's only teachers that they view as left, right? Like I know, I know plenty of teachers who, who, who go into class every day and spew off, um, you know, right-wing conspiracy theories that, that advocate all sorts of, of right-wing, under, you know, I know teachers who had, who had posters of, of Reagan in their room and any right-wing hero of theirs. I, I, yeah. I had a, a, a community college professor of meteorology hand out Fox News articles on why climate change was a hoax right. <laughs> in a community college. I mean, come on, they're everywhere yeah. and they never get any pushback. There's never any threat to their jobs. I mean, I, I had more explicitly conservative or right-wing professors in my career than anything else. Most people, you know, w would go out of their way to conceal whatever their personal beliefs were. But those that felt comfortable expressing it were always, almost always conservatives. Absolutely. Yeah. My, my entire educational experience from kindergarten to, you know, graduate school was almost exclusively with right-wing prof professors or neoliberal professors. You know, it's just like those, those are pretty much like, that's the variation that you get. Um, so I, I think that what I, I want my story to kind of um, serve as as a reflection of the current political moment um, and the current political climate and and the things that we um, can take for granted, um, like having a supportive administration or having um, you know the the kind of defense of transparency be there for us until push comes to shove, because then when when you become uh, a target. Uh, all of those defenses, uh, crump, they, just, they just crumble, right? Like they, 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 it's almost as if they were never there to begin with, right? Uh, people, um, and I, and again, you know, I think that that your your episode on Red Menace really touched on this is that the the liberal establishment is incapable of standing up to fascism because they they know that at the end of the day that their their economic interests in particular. 
um, even if there there are social differences in, in terms of how they might view the world, um, that they would rather capitulate to the fascists, right, uh, than, than stand up to them and, and potentially create a, a bigger political rift um, between themselves and, and the most reactionary right-wing forces. And, and we need to, as um, educators and, and people who are, are concerned parents, you know, um, really understand that uh, they aren't, they are not backing away from this fight. In, in the area that I live, we have, um, you know, some several people that are that are running for open school board seats that are openly aligned with uh, right wing, um, you know, militant right wing groups um, that have been uh, caught on on tape saying things like they believe that immigrants should have their heads smashed into concrete, right? Um, and and this is this is a person who is who is very open um, about uh, their their views of of Western supremacy, um, anti-Semitism, um, and and they're they're running for school board. These are the people who want to shape the curriculum. Right. So when they when they say that the, the people who are, you know, quote unquote, leftist, Marxist, whatever, that they're they're really the ones that are, are controlling behind the scenes. Like I, I challenge anyone uh, to pick up a textbook that a school is using and, and try to find the Marxist indoctrination <laughs> in those books. Right. right? Like it, it's, it's just laughable. It's True. it's absolutely ridiculous. So we, we need to take this um, as the threat that it is um, for for the future. Right. That they are are. They they feel like as if they're losing the the battle, so they're they're now coming with with the full force and the might that they have, um, and especially with recent political movements, you know, especially centered around people like Trump and DeSantis, uh, being able to to rile up um, even I think more moderate Republicans in, into a frenzied uh, kind of like fascist uh, conspiracy theory, um, you know horde of, of individuals that are that are are willing to to get the pitchforks and the torches and and go to war over it exactly. you know and that's that's a frightening reality yeah you said something about them being against teachers and and making it more and more precarious for teachers just to do their their job in a multitude of ways the broad the broadband assault on public schools in general the low wages the constant hating of teachers unions um, you know, the the idea that they're all being indoctrinated, but then also the mask thing, the, the, the right wing movement is like in the middle of a global pandemic, um, you know, saying that really trying to I mean, w whatever they, they explain it to themselves in their heads, actively trying to make a less safe environment physically for teachers and students in the school because of their insane conspiracy theory about masks and, and government tyranny and all this bullshit. So it's just this, this constant assault. It was, it was heightened during the pandemic. It's heightened after the pandemic. It takes on many, many different forms. Um, but this is an absolute important front in the fight for the future. And we have to understand, as you and I have alluded to so much throughout this conversation, this hardcore reaction, as reaction always does, comes from a place of profound insecurity. It comes from a place of feeling like they're losing their grip as, as the dominant, you know, racial, class, religious, whatever, you know, milieu at the top of the hierarchy. They feel that in these various ways, um, less and less secure in that position. And so this backlash, this reaction is, uh, you know, fundamentally coming from that place of profound insecurity and really what undergirds insecurity? Fear. Um, and, and fear drives right wing politics and it can it can undergird a lot of hate, a lot of the insane hate or the racism or the bigotry. If they had the capacity to know themselves and look deeply within and see what's underlying those feelings of hatred and bigotry, it so often is a profound sense of insecurity and gut wrenching fear that they can't look at. And so it must be projected out onto society. Um, and, and that's happening right now. And in so many ways, I think you and there probably are other examples, but are a canary in the coal mine because this is not going away. These attacks on education, these attacks on our future, these attacks on equality, on diversity, on just basic fucking human decency are only going to ratchet up as all of the old norms and the old center of politics continues to fall out of the bottom. Um, and so if, you, if anybody out there is in the teaching education world, is thinking about going into the education world, you should do that. Um, you know, kids need to be taught and they need to be mentored and they need to be helped. You know, this shouldn't dissuade you from going into that profession, but it should equip you with some 
um, warnings and some things to look out for and some things to avoid doing um, if you can. And to know that, look at this situation where you were just t- contacted ostensibly by a parent looking for information and you were the good willing teacher to step out, go meet with coffee in your free time, try to help this person and, and their kid. And you got punished for it, brutally punished for it. Um, and so, you know, people listening to this story can see some of these tactics and can at least be on the lookout for them and to try to protect themselves as they enter this increasingly, sadly, precarious field. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that perfectly summarizes it. Is there anything else uh, before we wrap up that you would want to say? Anything else you want to quote? Any last words you want to leave us with or anything else that we missed uh, throughout this conversation? Um, no, I, I just also wanted to extend my uh, gratitude to you know the listeners of, of Rev Left when you did that um, episode, and I think that you did such a fantastic job, you know, keeping keeping my identity at the time completely like off off the table, and, and I listened to that when just tears in my eyes and a, an incredibly heavy grateful heart, um, and to all all of the listeners who who sent you know any funds that we're able to help during that time, um, you know, just so, so incredibly thankful and moved by the overall generosity of, of your audience. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people probably knew which story you were talking about at the time, but even ones who didn't still, still, you know, decided to, to donate a couple bucks to, to help out. And that was, um, was really just like a moment of, of clarity that, and, and you've said this numerous times on, on your show and throughout the time that we've known each other that like what the right ostensibly lacks is, is community, you know, and that, and that is what we have that they do not, right. That we, we ultimately are the foundation of our beliefs is, is on, is built on a foundation of, of building community, extending um, community, understanding that we are here on this you know planet in the middle of space, in the middle of the universe floating together, that we we're all on this rock together. Right. And that we are um, ultimately trying to make a better world for everyone to exist in. Um, and and I just you know want to say thank you as as much as I possibly can extend that gratitude to everyone who, who listened to that and, and felt compelled to to help. Well, yeah, and I just want to say thank you so much to my audience. It makes me so proud that I've been able to foster a sort of audience that can behave that way and can come to the to the, you know, have the back of somebody who they don't even know, but they just know, share our values of, as you said, ultimately, a world of more justice, more equality, more truth, more love, more caring. And uh, that will always be our advantage over the far right, because no matter what they tell themselves, the functional role their politics play is one of fear, division, hatred, and making a more precarious, more scary world for the generations coming up. And that's what we, we, we stand against that. So sue us. <laughs> you know, I don't believe in bigotry. I don't believe in racism. I don't believe in genocide. I don't believe that just because you're white or you're rich that you're an inherently better person than other people. And that makes us, I think, good, decent, regular human beings, not some scary Marxist conspirator monsters out here trying to ruin the lives and minds of young, impressionable children. Um, so, yeah, thank you to my audience. And from the bottom of my heart, you know, thank you for being willing to come on and tell your story. You took a hit uh, for a much broader movement. Um, you have been kicked out functionally of doing what you love to do um, f- through no fault of your own. And I think this was an in- insane injustice. And um, I don't want to see it happen again. And I know you don't want to see it happen to your fellow teachers. And so hopefully by getting this story out, telling your side of the story, putting our finger on some of the strategies that the right employs, that we can at least... Um, you know, act as a bulwark or help other people um, prevent themselves from from having happened to them what so unfairly has happened to you and your family. So I just wanted to say I'm so fucking sorry that you've had to go through this and and the courage of you and your family uh, in the face of this has has really truly been inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, um, we'll end it there. Uh, love and solidarity. And I'm sure what, wherever your life takes you next, um, there's a purpose in there because you are at the at the bottom of your being a good person. And I, I do believe that in most cases, things shake out for genuinely decent human beings. So love and solidarity. Thank you to my audience who, who came to his uh, support when he needed it, even when the details weren't always on the table. And um, we're always here for you. If you want to come back on, clear up anything else, if anything else develops, you know, you have a home here at RevLeft. Thank you so much.